All right, so today's session, we're gonna be talking uh, mostly about account administration. Um, that's where you go to set up users for the system or set them up for your department if you're a manager. We're also gonna talk about user access, kind of what that is and what the different types of access look like and in what situations you would give a certain level of access or not. Uh, then we're going to come back here to the dashboard and talk about this section um, for that's called pr uh, public processes. I've touched on this just a little bit um, along the way, uh, but I want to say a few more things about public processes. And then we're going to start to get into the beginnings of process assignment, which is right here. Um, and to demonstrate process assignment a little bit, I'm going to do a recap on um, all of the managerial processes that we've been talking about um, that are in our process library. And we'll slowly kind of walk through those again. And I'll, I have got quite a few requests to talk about this one a little bit more. This is the strategic planning um, that I began talking about last week. Uh, so we'll go through each one of these. I'll talk about what they are and remind you to where to find them. And then I'll demonstrate this again, the strategic planning. So to get to process assignment, um, you go all the way to the right-hand side of the screen, and there's a wheel icon, furthest one to the right. When you click the wheel icon, you're going to see these two sections, um, user accounts and account settings. So let's go to user accounts first. If you log into your Touchstone account and you don't see this wheel icon over here, all that means is that you're not an administrator and therefore don't have access to account administration. If you are on the line now and um, that's your situation, I'd say this this session is still useful for you because you'll see you know, how user access has been set up and maybe how someone has set it up for your department and if that works and, and why and how to change it. So this is called the user list. And if you've set up users for your system already, you'll see the, um, you'll see them listed here on the user list. If you see one um, set up here, so this very first one next to the key, cap, the yellow key, that means that you only have one user set up for your system so far. So if it's blank, then that's a great opportunity for you to go and create users. If you see users set up here, then that means that someone has um, be begun to set them up already. Over here to the right, there's a scroll bar. So you can see I have a lot more users here. Um, so you scroll up and down to see uh, those users. So to add a user, you just hit this little plus sign right here. So right to the on the left hand side, I'm going to click add user. The first question is what type of user do you want to add? So there's basically two choices. There's an administrator, which is somebody who has access to everything in Touchstone and can do everything in Touchstone, including delete things, including being where we are right here. Um, and that gives that person has the ability to go and edit and change other people's access. So be mindful of who you make an administrator. Typically, I would see the owner, or the board of directors would be the administrator. Managers would have um, access to their departments and would have create access, which we're going to talk about. So they can create and edit and change processes on their job, just on their position and also on their employees' positions. But really an administrator is reserved for either the owner of the company or another scenario is if you've created a touchdown power user. So somebody who's kind of in charge of um, making sure that touchdown's running from the te technological side um, is the answer person maybe for questions that come up, can go and reset people's passwords if they can't figure out how to do that. So power user or high level position in the company. So I'm gonna choose um, user right here. So here you fill in the first and last name and then last, this needs to be you know, a real person's name. Um, down here is their email address. So if you, um, you want to put in real email addresses because if somebody does lose their password, then they're going to, the password's going to get sent to this email address. So clearly this isn't an, a, an, ac an accurate email address. So just know if you do put in fake email addresses, then whoever is trying to get their password when this user does, they won't be getting anything. In addition, 
this is the email address that is used for process assignment. So when you assign a process to an employee through the dashboard, if you decide to send a notification, then that um, person gets sent that notification to their username slash email address. And again, if it's not real, then they're not going to get it. Um, so put in your password and then hit save. Super easy. You'll see that user fall in alphabetical order on your list. So first name and then last name. Um, sorry, I'm just looking at somebody's. All right, so once you've made the user, if you wanna then edit that user or change any of the content, you just click the name. So you click right here and then it brings you back to this profile screen. So when I click the name there, I can change the status. So I could make this person now, I could make them an administrator if I wanted to. Um, I could change their first name, last name. Clearly, I could change their email address and also reset their password. So this is good to know because if you do have employees who um, have forgotten their passwords, this is, you could easily go in and any administrator can change or update the password. So I'm going to close out of this. This little green key here um, indicates that this person's an admin user. So if you see the little green key, you'll know this person is admin. If you've decided, well, based on what I'm saying, they shouldn't be an admin, then you just click their name here and then hit the drop down to user and hit save. And then their access has been changed to um, a non-admin user. Um, okay, so once your users are created, if you look over here to the right, you see this icon here called user access. And then you see the next icon over called control panel. If somebody is a non-admin, they haven't been made an admin, you will go and set their access. If they are admin, like Jack here, you can see that his pencil is grayed out here. And then it, that just verifies to me that he's an admin user. Um, so to the first thing to do is to go to user access for this user that you're working on and hit the little I pencil icon. Now I'm seeing um, my organization chart. You would see your organization chart kind of in this outline view. So what's happening here is you're deciding which position Jack should have access to. So if he's a non-admin user, then you're assigning him some type of access to Touchstone. Access can be read only or create. Read only means that whatever we give John access to, he's only going to be able to read it. He can't edit or change anything. He can just read what's there. If we give him create access, that means that he can edit and change what's all what's there. So anything that's been um, built on his position, any of his processes, he can go and edit and change the content of those processes. He can make new processes and add them to his position but it's limited to the positions that he's been given access to. So if I give Jack here access to this one, the manager of marketing and sales, he cannot go to the president's position and add processes there and change the content there. All he can do is edit and change what's on his position and the positions underneath him. So if you give someone create access to a managerial position, um, it's then going to automatically give them create access to the positions underneath them. Now, you can go to those positions and change that if you want to. You could make it read only, um, but it defaults because that's that makes sense, right? Based on everything we've been talking about, a manager's job is to create, develop, and train with processes. So that's why they would need to have access to all the positions underneath them to be able to do that. So let's go to Jack down here. Let's give him access to his position, which let's say it's customer service. If I click that position, I here's where I choose read or create. If all I want him to do is to be able to read what's there on this customer service position, then I choose read and then I hit update. Then you're gonna see this position has turned this orange color. So let's say in addition to that, I wanna give him access to the bookkeeper as well. So I choose bookkeeper and let's say he is the bookkeeper and I want him to be editing and changing and creating processes for himself. Then I would give him create access to that and hit update. Then you can see with the blue that he now has create access to this position. 
this can be changed or undone quite easily. All you do is click on this and now I can remove access altogether or I could change it to read. Let's uh, log in. So that's user access. One more thing before we're gonna log in as Jack and I'm gonna show you what that looks like. But one more thing before we do that, we just assigned him user access right here. And now we're gonna assign him a control panel. The control panel appears on the dashboard. So when this person logs in, that's the first thing they're gonna see under uh, on the dashboard, they'll see their position there. So if we click control panel, I'm gonna go down and give him a control panel. Um, let's give him a control panel for customer service. When you click the control panel access, it's gonna ask you, is John a manager or not a manager? So let's make him not a manager because if you notice from the org chart, there's no positions underneath him. So then I hit update. And so now if we scroll down here, we can see here that he has a control panel for more customer service. If you were to give a person and you will give people control panels for managerial positions that they fill, like this one, then that gives them management review for the positions underneath them. So on the dashboard, when a manager logs in, they'll first see their control panel, if it's this one, and then they'll see all of their subordinate positions listed under here. So if I have four customer support people and they've all been assigned a control panel for customer service, then I would see all of them on my dashboard because I'm their manager. So let's hit done on this. And then let's log in as Jack. And I'm gonna refresh my screen here. So this is what it looks like when Jack logs in. Dashboard super clean and simple looking. All he's gonna see is his position here, customer service. If he selects his position, he's then gonna see his processes all listed here. So this is what I've given him access to, every process on his position, every process that's been linked to his box on the org chart for all customer service people, for that matter, all appear here on the dashboard. Here, everything is read-only by default. Nothing gets edited or changed through the dashboard. All I can do is click on these and I can see the content in them. I can complete checklists, I can fill out forms, but everything's read-only here. But if you remember, if we go over to the org chart, we also gave him, um, we also gave him um, access to, I thought I gave him access to another position. Maybe I didn't. Let's log back out and take a look. So I'm gonna close this and then we'll be back. So here's Jack. Let's go to user access. Hmm, interesting. So I think it's a log out. I think it's the problem is I have to log out and log back in. So let's do that and see if that works. Log back in. A lot of times if you're changing access or doing certain things in, a, in a account administration, if it doesn't appear like it just happened to me, then try to log out and log back in and it usually sticks. So let's go back to Jack here and let's give him bookkeeper. Staff and then update and done. So now let's log at back and log back in as him. And you should see two control panels there when we log back in. Here we go, log in. So now this is two control panels that he has for this position. And if we go here to the org chart, um, you would see uh, those boxes illuminated on the chart. Sometimes employees can have multiple control panels if they have multiple positions. So if they fill multiple positions on your org chart, then they're going to have multiple, you can assign them multiple um, control panels. So I'm going to log back out here and log back in as me. All right. This uh, setup that I have here now also um, shows you what it looks like when someone has a managerial control panel. So here I have a control panel for this position. And because I have a managerial control panel, I also see management review for the positions underneath me here. So these people have been assigned control panels for the bookkeeper. And because I'm their manager above them on the org chart, I see them here in the management review section. 
so let's go back here to user accounts. Um, so user access, that's one step. That's deciding what you're going to give that person access to and what level of access, read only or create. And then second step is control panel. So giving them a control panel or control panels for the positions that they fill. So to show you one more thing about this, I'm gonna to go to my name here and click control panel. Let's say this is a future organization chart, like I've encouraged you to build. And in at in the time, at the time being, I as the owner am the board of directors. So I'm gonna give myself a control panel for that. I'm the president, so I'm gonna give myself a control panel for that. And then I'm also the office manager or the manager of administration and finance because again, the business is growing. Um, we haven't quite got to a place where we have full-time positions in these roles. So I am those three positions. So if that's the case, I give myself control panels for all three of those positions. And then if we go back here to the dashboard, this is what it looks like. Why this is um, a good thing to do if you're in this situation is it can help you to compartmentalize the work that you do. So I'm, you know, you, you only have a certain number of hours in a week and you can't have full, you can't do full-time work for each one of these roles or positions. So your time has to get fragmented or segmented in into doing the type of work that each of these roles or positions demand. So through the control panel view, I could look at what I do as the president here. So all the processes on my position, budgeting, creating and maintaining industry contacts. Here's quantification. I do my key indicators, employee management. That was an important one. So I can look at this list of things that I do and say maybe half a day on a Friday, I'm gonna do the present president work. Once a month on a Tuesday, I'm gonna do uh, work for the board of directors. And then because this is the most active role filled with the most employees, maybe I spend 75% of my time on this role. And the control panel, just by clicking into the processes and having priorities for what you wanna work on in terms of documentation or managing employees, you can see where it can help you kind of with time management. Uh, so let's go back here again. Uh, you can also delete positions that you've created or users that you've created. And it's this red X right here. When you delete a user, so I'm gonna delete Sam here, it's gonna say, are you sure? You say, okay, but nothing drastic happens. You, He's removed from the active user list. He's gone from here, but he's down here um, on the deleted list. And we keep these deleted users this way because if you ever wanna go back in history and see control panel work like checklists or forms or anything that a former employee did, um, you can restore that position and see that work because it'll stay forever. So it's just a safety measure to make sure that none of, no data that you've decided you wanted to look at five years later, it's still going to be here. Um, admin users, like Jack, here's an admin user. You can see where the, gray, the delete is grayed out. This is just like another safety mechanism to make sure that you don't accidentally delete admin users. They're gonna fall to the deleted user list and you can restore them, but it's just an extra thing that we've done. So if there's an admin user, you wanna take that user and then make him a, a, a regular user, so take the admin status away, and then you can go and delete that user and the red, the green, red X will appear again. Um, all right, so that's the gist of account administration. I think the important thing to do is to set up your employees if you haven't done that already. At the time for the time being, we're not charging for additional users. It's a it's something that we gave as a, a gift to our users during the pandemic because we wanted to help people um, be able to use Touchstone to manage employees that were suddenly having to work from home. And so we made users unlimited. That That is still um, active today. So if you haven't set up users, there's no reason not to. To get this result of uh, training with processes, um, using processes, having uh, work done consistently and accurately, managing with processes, well, you have to get your employees in touch on using them. I mean, that's a prerequisite to it all. 
If you don't do that, then you're spending a lot of time building processes and procedures that probably will never be used because there's nobody in the system using them. So set up your employees. I think that there's this fear that comes up with this where it's like, well, now I have to train everybody on how to use it and you're going to get pushback and people aren't going to want to do it. Um, you know, face that fear, challenge yourself, do maybe implement in increments, like small bits. Don't give someone 20 processes and say, here, learn all these now in Touchstone while you're using, while you're learning how to use Touchstone. Give them one or two processes to learn and to view. Um, decide on one thing that's going to happen in the department. Maybe it's that um, building processes, building process solutions to frustrations that we talked about a few weeks ago. Um, maybe it's a simple um, HR process on your employee handbook or any kind of software how to choose something that you think is basic and then get your employees involved in using it. The reality of all this is, though, if you're if you have a company that's past you know 10 employees, say you need to rely on your managers to help with this, too. So this row of managers becomes very important to the implementation and the use of processes in Touchstone or any system, because the manager here should be the one who's training the positions below here and teaching them not only how to use Touchstone, but what it means to be managed with processes. Um, taking maybe 50% of what they do or even 25% of what they do and demonstrating how that rudimentary work can be designed into workflow and, and into a step-by-step -step that builds consistency for everybody that does it. So the manager here is responsible for that. This person and, and, charge, and head of everyone else, if you have layers of management like salesperson, sales assistant, this person needs to be helping with the implementation of processes and touchstone. If this person's the only one who's doing it and you have the added fact that maybe you're getting pushback from these people, you can see what an unworkable situation that is. You can't just stomp your feet and say, okay, everybody do it. You need support from your team. So getting these people involved in that is just critical because once the manager gets involved and starts pushing it down to these people here, well, then that's where the change really happens. Um, if you're having issues or feelings about training people with touchdown, lean on us for that. You know, we have a team that can do one-on-one -on -one trainings with your people. We can do group trainings. We love doing stuff like that because it means people are learning how to use touchdown, which is important. So use this account administration up here to first set up all of your users um, and then assign them access to Touchstone and then maybe send an email out to everyone and say, you know, I, this is your username and password to Touchstone. Um, get in, go through some tutorials, take a look at it. We're going to talk about it in our next meeting and just kind of step people slowly towards it that way. Um, also over here on the right hand corner, we have account settings. So we talked about a user settings. Here's account settings. So account settings has to do with the look and the feel of your Touchstone account. So this header up here, this white header, as well as my logo you see here in the corner. Um, so the bit, the business settings, um, this company name is called Touchstone or Training Touchstone. Whatever is in this field here is your official company name. Um, and if you hit this display company name button over here um, and then refresh, your company name appears. Um, your header and logo right here um, can be changed just by choosing the color here. You can insert a color that if you have the number for it and you can drag and drop to find a color. And once you're happy with the color, then you would hit save and then that color populates this header. Um, also the text header, that's this black up here. You can change the colors of that. So if your header is white and then you turn the text white, well, then you're not going to see, you know, what's over here on the right-hand corner. So make the header different from the text color. And then lastly, this is your, where you drag and drop your logo. You can take a simple logo off your website, just using the snipping tool and then drag it into here and it'll upload here on this corner. Um, if you don't want your company name to display, then uncheck this field. This is what it looks like unchecked now. And if you, you can also uncheck your logo for whatever reason you want to have it not display without deleting it. So that is um, account settings.
it's kind of nice to have your logo in the upper corner here and have the colors kind of look familiar to the, just because when your employees do log in, they're going to say, oh, it, it's going to look familiar to them. It looks more like something that belongs to you. Um, all right. So let's talk about, um, let's talk about one more thing before we move on to public processes. Uh, just a few more thoughts on user access. So if a person's a manager, and we went over this before, um, you give them a managerial control panel for this position, then they automatically get the positions underneath them in management review. So this is what I, what I showed over here. So here, this is my control panel. Because I'm a manager in all three of these roles, I'm gonna see every employee listed here under management review. When you have the top box on the org chart as the, as your control panel, you automatically see inside of every employee's control panel. So you can go here under management review and you can see every single employee in the company. So the top box on the org chart sees everyone, not just the row underneath them, but everyone. Um, and the idea of that is if you're the president and you wanna run reports and see if your all of your bookkeepers have been doing what they're supposed to be doing or your manager has been doing one-on-one -on -one meetings with them, you can run a report over here and see that they have without asking them. So let's go back here. If you have a situation like this one here, where this is the entry level, this is the lead or the, the junior, and then this is the senior, it might be a, a scenario where the senior techs don't manage the apprentice techs, where really the manager here manages them. So, but you like it in this kind of laddered approach because it shows the, the the movement that can happen for the tech positions through the org chart. When anyone looks at it, they can see it. I can move from here to here to here, but this person isn't necessarily my manager. If that's the case, then give the senior tech, every senior tech, a non-managerial control panel for this position, and then they won't see these two positions underneath them. So go over here to account administration. I'll just show it to you real quick. So in my in Mike's role right here, if I'm going to give him a control panel for, um, let's go to this, senior tech, and I click senior tech, I'm going to make it a staff position and then hit update. <clears throat> he has a control panel now for this position, but he won't have management review for these underneath him. There might be reasons why you don't want your employees to be in that position, being able to go in and see the work that they're um, that the other techs are doing. Um, all right, so let's go back here to the dashboard. So public processes, public processes are defined as public because they're company wide. So one rule about this area is you really want to focus on only putting processes here that are company-wide. So they're going to be the types of work or processes that the entire business needs to have access to. Everybody needs to use at one point or another. If you don't <clears throat> keep that rule and you don't um, make these truly public, then no, when anybody looks at this list, they're not gonna be able to see what they're supposed to do and what other people are doing. So the accountability is, is lacking if you do that. A better thing is to use the control panel to assign processes and then have them access through control panel rather than just dumping them here in the public area. Because if I have a process on my position here of the manager and admin finance, I know that's my accountability because it's here in my role. If it's over here, I don't. I, I'm left wondering. Well, what it, it, is this really something I'm responsible for? Or is it just there because it's there? So think about that when you're creating the public processes. I think sometimes people like to put processes here because when you log in, it's like it's right there in front of your eyes. You just log in, boom, it's there. It's only one click to get into. A position and see the processes. So admin, and it's further, I have this great ability to make these groups out of all the work. So I'm going right to what it is that I'm searching for, and it's organized by a group. I can even hit this expand collapse, and now I see everything if I want to see it all at one time. 
So if you count clicking on the um, on the groups, then maybe it's two clicks, not one. Um, but it really defeats the purpose of the public processes and I think becomes confusing in the long run if you put processes here in public that aren't truly public. So some examples of public processes, a lot of HR things tend to be public. So employee handbook here, um, time off vacation request, um, reviews, uh, objective kind of things or philosophies or your mission purpose values. These all tend to be really great public processes all here, right? Accessible for anyone who needs to look at them. Things that are done and used by all employees like satisfaction surveys. This is a pretty great process, by the way, if any of you have ever thought of um, having creating employee satisfaction surveys. This comes from our library and it's this pretty, there's different examples that you can use, but it's a nice way to kind of take the temperature of your employees. We talked during the org chart about trying to create a game worth playing, like a place people want to be. And sometimes you don't know that until you ask, is this a place you want to be? Is this a, what do you think about the environment that we're working in? What do you think about the team effort? What do you think about, does your manager treat you fairly? Are you valued? A really great, this is kind of an aside, but a, a really great process to use with surveys is also that um, frustrations process we talked about before, where you turn a frustration into a process solution. So if I do a survey and I get a lot of people saying that um, they don't feel like there's a team effort, that it's all about me and you or us and them, well, maybe you want to develop a process around that for how can you create a more a, a better team environment or how can you value employees more? So you go through that frustrations, um, issues process and come up with like a process solution for that. And that's a really powerful thing in the minds of your employees when they can tell you this is a problem and then you can take that and you come up with a real solution for it. Like that is just the epitome of being heard, really. So that's the, this employee satisfaction surveys process, which you can find um, in the process library. I believe it's in running the business. Other types of review things, like every employee has a 60-day review at one point or another um, when they're new. So this is the, these types of processes can be good public processes. Emergencies, you know, safety things, um, what to do in disaster situations. Clearly, that's a good public process. Anything that you would have like an in-service on or an all-company meeting where you bring in a consultant or anything like that and they're giving you information, if you don't take that information that you've paid for and they've given all your employees and, and build something out of it that can stand well past when that person leaves, you've kind of, you know, you've educated a group of employees, but the rest of it is lost to the other employees. So try to build process out of that and then make that a public process. I've seen public processes around time management, um, around um, safety trainings, things like that. Uh, I think I already said that this, but mission purpose values, I think this is a great thing to have here. Um, it can be just one form here on what the mission purpose value is, values are. So a new employee could go right to this and review it and be able to see it whenever, when they're new. And then when also they just want to be reminded. <clears throat> to make a process public, I'm going to go here to running the business. You just select the process. Let's choose this one. And then you hit this little P, public sign. And now touched on, put this process in the public folder on the dashboard. I can also make it unpublic. So if I click this again, then it, it's removed from the folder. So pretty easy. Um, one other great thing to have here are software how-tos. So you see CRM how-tos. If you have specialized software for just one department, then that, that doesn't really need to be here. It can be in the control panel for those positions. But it's if it's software the whole, employ, um, the whole company uses, then yeah, have it here, software how-tos. Um, all right, any questions about that? I'm gonna check. Um, sorry, I can't read this. I'll come back to this at the end, whoever sent me the message. It's smooshed up. 
Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit or begin a conversation on process assignment. And then, um, like I said in the beginning, I'm going to end with reviewing the, I think it's like the top five management processes that we've been through um, during this whole seven series session. So you probably noticed this big assign button that appeared here on the dashboard a few months ago. Um, process assignment gives you the ability to take a process in Touchstone and assign it to an employee. When you assign the process, the employee gets a notification saying you've been assigned this process and these little red um, indicator lights appear next to the person's name. You see, I have an assignment right here. So they'll know, they'll get emailed about it. Then they'll also know because this little assignment window comes up. When I see an assignment, I know that my manager has assigned me something. If I click on my control panel and I look over here to the right, I can see all of the assignments that have been given to me and the due dates for them. When I complete an assignment, it falls down here to this completed area. So when that little icon appears, you can click right away and see over here what the assignment is. So why process assignment is valuable is it puts the process in front of the employee, you know, kind of isolates it from touchstone inside of its organized um, screens and puts it in the employee's, you know, consciousness. It's a great way um, to manage with processes because if I have processes that I've trained my employees on and I notice someone's not doing something, I can go through it with them in a one-on-one -on -one meeting, and then I can also assign it to them. And they'll get a note from me saying, this has been assigned, this is why, and then they they're, they're kind of forced to view it and look at it. So this is a great tool for managers because it helps you <clears throat> to uh, train your employees with the processes without necessarily having to sit and have a long conversation with them or even email them. You're giving them access right to the process. Assignment can also be used to get someone to help you document a process. So if we in a meeting have decided that the sales follow-up process needs better scripting, I could go here to someone in sales, the whole sales team, or one person that I've decided I want them to work on this. I can assign them that process, make a note and say, um, will you document this process? You know, go to the four key functions to the to the process, click it and write out the work plan, build the scripts. So that's another way to assign processes. And then if this whole area allows you to kind of track it too, because you can see the dates that they were assigned and then the due dates. So there are two ways to assign a process. One way is to go here to this assign button. And when I click it, I then see the assignment window will appear. I go here under users and I see all of my people in management review. So everybody who's over here and behind me in management review appears here in my assignment window. If I was just, I, I gave myself these two control panels as an example, and that's why we're seeing a lot of positions and people here, but normally um, a manager would click and see maybe four or five positions with titles underneath. So I choose the person that I want to assign the process to, let's say it's Jack. I hit the drop down here, and now I'm seeing all of the um, processes that I can assign to him. So these are all the processes that um, are on in his position. I also see the public processes down here. So let's say that I want John to review the emergencies and injuries process for whatever reason. I click that, then I'm gonna go to the due date. So here I select a due date for the assignment. I can choose to send a notification or not. Remember, this goes to the username, the email address. And then here in the notes field, I can put the why, I can put you know the what it's about. So use this field to tell your employee why it is that you're assigning this to him or her. And then I hit assign. So now Jack gets this notification saying that this process has been assigned to him. If I want to look at the assignment, I can go here in management review, click on the person I assigned it to, 
and then I see it in the assignments window. So that's one way to assign. There's another way which has to do with assigning a tool within a process. So in this example, I assigned the whole process. Another way is to assign a tool within a process. So like a checklist or a form, you don't want to have them view the whole process. You're just saying, fill out this checklist or fill out this form. In that case, I would go to the person who I'm going to assign it to. Then I choose the process I want to assign. Let's say it's finance checklist. I see the checklist here. I choose it. Well, this is the group and there are four checklists here. Over here, I go to the assignment window. So you've got to go into the process first and then choose the tool you want to assign. So it's a couple levels deeper than just hitting that assign button on the dashboard. So let's do it back from the beginning. So I choose the person who I want to assign the process to. Let's say it's Bill this time. These processes, whenever you see this, these processes aren't organized, which is something that you should do with your employees, you know, as soon as possible once you've they've been created as users. So what I mean by unorganized is they're not in groups. They're all in the default list. That's what it looks like. If I click this, it's going to open and show me. It's way better to have these in groups because it's not just looking like this massive list of things. I'm creating these little nice work groups and then drag and dropping the processes into them. So I click um, the person I want to assign to. I choose the process that I want to assign the person, finance checklist. I click open the checklist. And then here are the four checklists that I can choose from. I can go here to assign the monthly finance checklist. And then the assignment window comes up. I go to the due date, choose the due date, send a notification, and then I put the Y in here like you missed this last month and then you hit assign. The person gets a notification that they've been assigned this checklist. When they log into Touchstone, they go to the assignment and all they need to do is click their control panel. So we're gonna go to me here and all they have to do is look to the right here and the assignment will appear there. They'll see your name, who assigned it to them. They click on the process, on the assignment, they complete the checklist. When they hit save and complete, the manager gets a notification that it's been done. So my newest assignment is down here at the bottom. So these due dates have all passed and I didn't do those <laughs> in this example anyway. So I assigned myself this um, before this meeting just so you could see like a real life example. So I got a notification saying your manager has, has assigned you the strategic planning um, for human resources process. If I click on this, I see the actual document that's been assigned to me. I click it open and here it is. If we go back here, I can also look at the notes. So here he's written to me, complete your strategic target for Q3 and four. Remember to include the hiring of finance positions and document new positions. So this is where that note appears. So anybody could view the note once they see the assignment. And then all they would do is click right on it, go to what's been assigned. I would fill all this out and save and complete it. And then my manager gets a notification saying I've done it. So this, by the way, is that um, strategic planning uh, process that I'm going to recap for you, but we went over last week. So this is a tool where I, as the manager, am tracking my annual priorities, and then I'm putting them into quarterly priorities. And then in my one-on-one -on -one meetings, my manager and I are talking about them and ticking things off that I've done. So I get this assignment saying, you need to work on three your priorities for three and four. I fill all this out. And when I'm finished with it, let's say I'm working on it one day, but I'm not done with it. So I don't want my manager to think I'm done with it. I can just save it. And it'll date and time, time stamp it and save it. But then I can come back to it next week and continue finishing it up. And when I'm really done, I hit save and complete. And then that gets sent to my manager saying she's done it. If I come back later and, and he sends me feedback saying you need to change it in this way or that way, I could actually uncomplete it and then add more to it if I wanted to. 
Um, but this back and forth can happen with forms like this. And for things like strategic planning, I think this works really well because we can work on this together and kind of brainstorm it and go back and forth with it until we decide that it's done. I wouldn't necessarily have to sit in a meeting and do that. If I go back here, you can see that this strategic planning has now fallen to my completed assignments. <clears throat> so under completed assignments, my manager could go and assign it to me again and say, no, you did this all wrong, do it this way. I'd get that note in a new assignment. But if I wanted to go back to it for whatever reason, to add more to it or um, to change something, I'd just click here and I'd go right back to it. So that's the gist of process assignment. And we're going to go through this and, and I'm going to run through a couple like real examples again in next week's session when we mostly focus just on the dashboard functionality here. But to me, this is like pretty exciting work to have happen um, for the processes in terms of a manager's ability to make sure that their employees are using processes and the manager's ability to manage with processes because it's not just me documenting the process and then training you and then hoping that you follow it. I can train you in Touchstone. I can mark you as trained in that process. If you do something incorrectly or you miss a step, I can now go and assign you that same process and say, you know, we talked about this last week, review it for me. Look, tell me where you went wrong. So this whole back and forth that needs to happen when you're managing with processes can happen right in Touchstone with the real processes themselves. Um, so let's go back here and talk about management processes again. So I have this group. You see how different this looks than that one where we went to and it was just the default list? This looks different because I've made these groups and I've organized the processes into groups. If I click this expand collapse, I can see all the processes in every group if I want to. And I can drag and drop between groups this way as well. Um, and then if I hit this, it collapses again. So the usability of the control panel, I think to a certain degree, the, the, the more comfortable you can make it for the employees, the better, rather than just seeing the default list and having to click on it. If I see these little categories that either I've created for myself or my managers helped me create, it makes it more usable. So I'm going to click this management. So here's some processes that we've been through so far. We talked about the one-on-one -on -one meeting process. This is a fantastic management tool. This is that idea of this is that we sit down once a week, once a month, once a quarter, if that's all you can muster up, and we talk about how things are going. So we use this custom form, like an agenda form. Um, what items do we wanna discuss? What goals from last period? Um, how are you doing? That's an, also a really important question to ask your employees every once in a while. How's life going? It like, lets you lets them feel like you know the company cares about them. So one-on-one -on -one meeting you, where you can have this you know ongoing dialogue about how not only how are you doing, oh, I went back too far, but also how's work going? Can we let's how's this process working? How can we make this process better? What do I think you, ne you need to do next week or next month or next quarter to get better um, in your position? What are your goals for next year? So all these types of conversations which make people feel valuable. That's one-on-one -on -one meetings. Um, another uh, element to one-on-one -on -one meetings has to do with this process, which we didn't go into fully, but this is in the uh, Guiding the Business Library Employee Performance Review. So think of it like this, we're having one-on-one -on -one meetings once a month, say twice a month. So now we have 12 meetings or 24 meetings under us, one-on-one -on -one meetings. And then at the end of the year, we're having a performance review. And what we're doing is recapping everything that went down in these 12 meetings or these 24 meetings. Every employee deserves an end of the year review, not just necessarily for whether they're gonna get a raise or not, but it's just a checkpoint time to sit and say, how have you been doing? How are, um, what, what's happening in your position? All of the work from these, I could simply go here and run a report and say, give me all the one-on-one -on -one ag amended agenda meetings for Sam for all of last year. I get a list of those things right here through reports. I look at them and remind myself, what did we talk about at the beginning of the year, the middle of the year, the end of the year? And I use all that in good information to then construct my performance review. Um, 
then that's a really valuable review. It's not just something I've made up or I've been forced to kind of um, determine without any real evidence. I think that's why managers hate reviews because you oftentimes have to like just imagine what you're going to say and hope that it's right. And then you can never, you don't really have anything to back it up because someone, if someone asks why, well, then you have to go, well, that's just a feeling I have about you. <laughs> that's the worst. So if you have all that evidence in these one-on-one -on -one meetings, then performance review is easy. Um, we also talked about task delegation and work management. I'm going to put this one up to number three. So if you remember, this process is about delegating. This really goes well with process assignment because if I've gone through and decided what processes I can delegate, and if you remember this, oops, this form down here, the delegation exercise, this is where you write out work you can never delegate, work you can delegate after you write a process for it, work you can delegate right now. If you as a manager goes through this and comes up with your list of these things, the work you can delegate right now, take that work and delegate it and assign it to the employee for them to do it. Take it off your plate. Work that you um, need to document a process for, have this be your priority to come up with a list of processes that you can de delegate if you write them out, if you document the process for it. Um, you could go to the dashboard, um, go to that process, assign it to another employee and say, let's document this together or you start working on it um, and move more towards being able to do management work and not work you shouldn't be doing. So that's task delegation and work management. Another element of this is holding employees accountable to the things that you've delegated to them. So ta the process assignment's great for that. Um, then we talked about this one. This is process solutions for management. So the idea of this process is um, I go through a step-by-step -step of determining, you know, what, what problem is occurring right now. You go through this self-directed, outer-directed, process-directed. Is it my fault it's happening? No, it's your fault. Oh, no, really? Let's, let's make it the fault of a process. And then you go through a step-by-step -step for coming up with what that process is. So this is, I think, a fundamental management skill, being able to look at problems that occur and come up with process solutions. So here's a little exercise that you can do around that. So this guides you in, how do I make this process directed? How do I determine um, what the underlying cause is? What is the system solution for it? What priority does it have? So if you're a manager, say, and you have an employee who's complaining about something, you could assign them this process solutions form. And you can say in the assignment note, go through this with that problem and come up with a process solution. They're not allowed to make it self-directed or outer-directed. I can't say, well, it's the sales department's fault that they keep you know, overselling things, <laughs> or I have to come up with a process solution. Even if that process is not something that I, I work or happens um, in my department, because the managers can then work to say, okay, maybe he's right that we're overselling things. So let's go back to the sales process and see what we can fix. So if your employees come to you with problems like this, I mean, help them to own it. Um, especially if you are in the top box on the org chart and you've got managers who are coming to you with problems, have them own it. <laughs> come up with the process solution. And, and, make, and I, I'll make the point again that I can come up with a process solution that doesn't have anything to do with my department. If I'm right, I'm right. And then the sales department needs to deal with it. Um, this process also has... Uh, let's see, I think it's this form, frustration tracker. So here's this outline. You, so again, we don't need to like put the wheels on everything and go, okay, stop, we're not doing anything else until we fix this problem. You, that's not, that doesn't work in the real world. What you can do is track the frustrations or the problems, keep them on a list like this. If you have an employee that's complaining, send them the frustration form, have them fill it out, take the system solution to that and put it, have them put it on the list or you put it on your list. And we track these things. And then hopefully, you know, once a month, once a quarter, whenever we can fit it in and there's never going to be a good time, sit down and work on the, on the process, work on the solution. 
This is why this whole, you know, business area affected and missing results impact on the business or the customer. A lot of times when you start, you know, putting out the process here, and this is an example of that, when you start writing it out, like the receptionist shows up two to three times late every week, what's the business, what's the area affected? Well, management, sales, everybody. What's lost? All of this is lost. Who's at impact? All these people. So then then you're then you think to yourself once you lay it out like this wow this is a big deal but we should make time to do this it kind of brings it the priority back into focus so that's this process process solution for management you can change any of this too you download this from the library if you don't like this title you can change it if you don't like the way the work plan flows you can change it you could do a new form all of this is you know customized but this again is a primary fundamental skill of any manager when I'm interviewing managers, I always ask about this. How do you handle problems? What, what, if I was to give you this scenario, what would you do? And I make the scenario very people, very outer focus. So if that person is outer focus, they would latch onto that and say, well, it's that, that person and this person's problem. If they can, if they can view it as a process solution right away, well, then you know, you know that they are thinking in the correct way. Um, and then we start talking about last week, let me scoot this up, strategic planning um, for departments, for people, for positions. So I tailored this one to this human resources, 2024 strategic planning. And this is what the document looks like. So y'all saw me last week, go and download this process from the library, strategic planning. And then we made a copy of this form. And then we moved, we built a new process and called it strategic planning for human resources. And then we moved the form into it. And now this became the process that is strategic planning for human resources and is linked to the manager of human resources, the manager of admin finance position. And now this is their um, strategic planning for the year. So you could just simply look at, if you're a manager, you could look at your position here. This is you. And then all your employees underneath and you could build a strategic planning uh, form for every single one of them, for customer service, for bookkeeping, for reception. If you have multiple customer service people, then they all should get that, that, that form that they fill out. You can have individual goals. You can have department goals. If you have one person, it's a little bit easier because you're working just with them on what their goals are. Just because you're not a manager doesn't mean that you shouldn't be um, moving towards results like strategic planning, um, like improving um, what you're doing to get a certain result. All of that is, is really important for frontline employees. But if you're this person up here, these three people really need strategic planning because you're asking them, what are your goals for your whole department for the year? So up here, the board of the directors, the chairman of the board is setting goals for the company in order to increase the value of the asset. This person then implements those goals and makes sure they happen through these people down here. So doing strategic planning with your department heads is the way that that happens. So take that form, um, duplicate it, build it, at minimum build one for every department, link it to their position, and then go here and go here with them to the dashboard, your key managers, and play around with it. Have everybody select it from their control panel, just like this. Organize your processes that that hasn't been done yet. Choose the strategic planning process. Just go right to the form and fill out the form. So what is um, process development that you wanna get done? List it over here. This is for the whole year. The annual priorities is this section. What are goals like reducing employee turnover? We want it to be no more than 10% per year staff training, reporting. So you're listing out all of these priorities that you have for 2024, everything you wanna get done, and then break it down into the quarters. And then this becomes your action items. This becomes what you go back to with your managers, you know, once a month at least, and talk about where you're at, what have we done? And so this is the way, you know, you teach them to be strategic as well as you teach them to focus on process as much as you can. Because if you want to achieve a goal, oftentimes it's about documenting a process that will allow you to achieve that goal through your employees.